Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at the Simons Institute. I have the good luck to be on a sabbatical, and I couldn't wish for any nicer place to spend that sabbatical than at the Simons Institute. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, Dick Karp and uh, Christos and Alistair and all the staff. It's a fantastic place to be. And I was thinking why it is uh, actually such a, a nice place to be at the Simons Institute. And, Perhaps for all of those, those that know it, it's perhaps not you know, really that surprising. Um, it's like, if you think about it, and look a little bit at the structure, right? So in the, in the, in the background, there's like a you know, German organization, right? Then you have Greek and Italian wisdom, okay? Uh, then you have British direction and diplomacy. And finally, you have uh, American supervision and also money, and so that seems to be, uh, seems to be a very nice uh, combination, and so that's working out uh, fantastic well. So thank you very much uh, to everyone. I very much enjoyed. Now, um, what I will talk about is a very classic setup. The most classic setup and how uh, you know, codes are used, it's really the basic point-to-point -point communications problem. Uh, and so what we have is uh, the setup that Shannon set up in 1948 in where we have a source, just think of uh, bits, IID bits, they're transmitted over a channel. And the channel is something very simple, it just either maybe flips bits, or most of the time I just talk about something even simpler, it just erases bits or leaves the bits, that's called the erasure channel. And then we have a decoder at the other end, and of course our aim is to transmit information reliably, and we have some criterion, so for example the number of bits at the end at the decoder that we estimate wrongly, we want to be small, or perhaps the number of blocks. And the way, of course, to do this is uh, to use a code. And the idea of the code is to expand a little bit our set of, of our bits, make the, you know, instead of taking one bit, take a block, add a few bits to it, that's called the redundancy, and then transmit via these blocks. And then to use these blocks at the end and the extra redundancy at the decoder uh, is so that even in the case you have some problems in there, that you can still reliably uh, transmit. And that you can do this, and that you can do this for every given channel up to a particular rate called the capacity. That's exactly what Shannon had promised, and we know exactly what the capacity is. But how we actually do this in a computationally efficient manner, that's really what I want to tell you a little bit, and I want to tell you a little bit how over the last, you know, since 1948, essentially years, uh, you know, some ideas how what people came came up with, uh, so this typically is called, of course, the code word, and you know, typically that will be the block length, and those three parameters will play a role. Now, when we talk about coding in, a, in the setup of communications, they're really, you know, essentially what we worry about is exactly this curve, and there, you will see various versions of such curves around, and parameters will be different, but they will always look a little bit similar. You will have some parameter that describes the channel, so how many flips there are, how much noise is added, for example, in what's called an additive gaud no a white Gaussian noise channel, where you don't just flip bits, but you add some, uh, some noise to it, or, for example, the erasure probability. So there will be something that characterizes how good or bad the channel is, and the axis, sometimes you know, good will be on the left, sometimes on the right, just historically, because the way things uh, are parameterized are different. And then typically, we we'll worry about the probability of error, and this might be either bit or block probability of error. It doesn't really matter for our purpose. And then a code, together with some decoding algorithm, whatever we will consider, will give you some kind of curve and tells you how over the various parameters of the, um, of the channel, how good an error probability you get. And very often, we'll just not deal with a single bunch, but we'll deal with a whole family of such codes. And typically, the, the family will be characterized by the block length, so the length will become larger. And very much, you know, what we'll try to see is how do these curves approach, hopefully, this capacity limit, the limit that was promised by Shannon, okay? So how does the complexity grow? Can we get there? What are the parameters? That's really what we are interested in in this setup. Now, if you go back a little bit, so here's just some, you know, history, just trying to squeeze things uh, onto one slide from 1948, some of the developments. And so what's nice about coding, so I hope you have, you know, maybe some of these uh, words maybe you have heard, maybe Hamming, BCH, Reed Müller, Solomon, LDBC. Clearly, of course, I don't want to go through, you know, simply each of these things. I'll just pick out a few ideas and try to explain, um, you know, how they play in, in the overall story. What's nice about coding is that um, there's a very close relationship between 
what people have trying to come up with, the theoretical developments, and what people actually implement in real systems. So typically, you know, if someone comes up with something that's a little bit better, less, let's say more efficient, uses less energy, uh, within you know, some years, uh, you're you know, pretty much sure that this will actually go into, into systems. And originally, the real driving motivation were maybe space exploration, uh, probably also military applications. But then starting around in the, in the 60s, um, you know, driving thing was already basic communication. You know, some of you probably still remember uh, some of the modems, you know, that, that were used over telephone lines. And uh, for example, Codex was one of the driving company uh, that tried to exploit some of the ideas that uh, came up in the 60s exactly to build uh, such modems, and then of course later on you got fancy and fancy modems. And these days, of course, we have encodes in pretty much any system, whether it's storage or communication, you know, or simply basic communication over the internet, wireless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if you look at this, there are kind of some groups in there, and of course the grouping is maybe also a little bit uh, artificial. But what I want to do is I want to very quickly just talk a few words about this algebraic setup, then talk a little bit about uh, lattices down here and then spend some more time down here on, on, on recent developments. And I will be fairly quick in the first two topics, uh, uh, simply because I, I had to choose. And uh, also, just really, I want to say a few words just to, to contrast it on what's happening uh, these days, rather than really getting into the detail of what happened originally. So let me just say a few things about the early days. Um, and so in the early days, it was the ideas were really mostly algebraic. And so the idea was that, OK, so we need to find uh, a code. The first thing is you need to describe the code efficiently. And so the first thing you do is rather than just picking code words somehow that, that might be uh, good for the purpose, you want to give some structure of the code words. And a very nat natural structure of, for the codes is a vector space. So you're picking a vector space. And so all these codes that are up here are what's called linear codes. So these are Hamming codes, ritz holm codes, BCH codes. And in particular, um, what's interesting is that Hamming, who worked you know, more or less next door to, to Shannon when he came up with it, and who originally introduced his codes, he was actually originally not interested in coming up with a solution for the communication system. But his motivation was actually the computing problem. These were the you know, very early, early, early days of computing machines. Hamming was very, uh, you know, very prominent in this. And uh, at that point, I guess you had relays that were fairly unreliable. And so he wanted to know of how he could actually build more reliable machines out of uh, not very reliable components. And that's how he came up with his Hamming codes. And so the basic idea, um, uh, independent of the structure, was that if you think of now your block length, in this case, it's trivial, just three. You have your Hamming's uh, uh, cube in here, and you want to pick some points, is that you would like to pick points in the space that are far apart. Uh, and you would like to also pick many points, because many points means high rate, and far apart means that they are somehow resilient against errors. But of course, you cannot do the, you know, the, clearly there's some tension. And so ten tension is, you know, these are just two um, basic bounds that tell you that the more you pick, the higher the rate is then the less the distance can be, and that's kind of some asymptotic bound. And these two bounds, called the gilbert washam bound and the Elias bound, they're not the best ones, but they're reasonable bounds tell you that you, know, you can pick a certain number of points with certain distance, but it's not possible to pick many more or to have larger distance. Right? So this was the basic idea. Pick them in the space, and you should think of maybe perhaps a 1,000 or some reasonable number like that. And so, why do we want to pick them far apart? That's also fairly clear, because if we have some perturbation, let's assume this one of these bits is flipped, then we'll end up at some other point. And this distance here, this uh, distance d here, that uh, we choose the points, if we take up to half of it, um, then I can actually still decode, because I'll just take as a, as a decoding rule, map it back to the closest point uh, that is a code word. OK, so that was the basic idea of how we should construct code, and this was called bounded distance decoding. Now, where does algebra come in? Well, the algebra makes it kind of possible to do this in, a, um, in an efficient manner. So let me first mention where these codes were used. Well, as I said, space exploration was one of the early beneficiaries of it. And then perhaps one of the prominent, uh, most prominent examples where reed solomon codes were used was, of course, CDs which these days also look already a little bit outdated, but not that long ago, uh, pretty much uh, ruled the world in digital uh, media content. And of course, anything to do with storage. So where did uh, you know, algebra come in? 
Well, the algebra came in is to make things efficiently describable, uh, come up with codes that were at good distance, and come up with algorithms that allowed them to decode efficiently. Right? So this was the basic idea. Find, do some packing in Hamming space, use algebra, trying to come up with many points that are far apart, and come up with an efficient algorithm. OK, so that's all I really want to say about um, uh, the algebraic uh, notions in here, and really just to, to contrast it and later on with the ideas that I would like to set forth. Now, in the 70s, um, you know, things changed a little bit and some new ideas came in. And the, uh, the basic uh, point there was the following, that uh, on the one hand, when I gave you this notion before, it was some abstract channel, right? So you had zeros and ones, and then they got flipped and so on. But when you're actually using applications, you're transmitting, typically in real space, you're transmitting real signals. So these are not abstract zeros and ones, but these are, let's say, sinusoids or you know, some other signals. And even if you abstract it into a real space, what you now have is real numbers. You're having zeros and ones that you're transmitting, or pluses and minus ones, rather than the logical zeros and ones. So, once, you know, so how do you translate? Well, it's pretty obvious that you can take, for example, if you just want to transmit two signals, now this is a real axis here. Imagine, for example, a voltage along a line or maybe uh, some other you know, real value signal, that you can just match the logical zero and one, perhaps, to the plus minus one. But perhaps you need more of them, and then it's also fairly clear that you can, uh, can take big sequences to label these things. But if you think about what you're really doing, right, then what you're really doing is you're picking points in some, uh, you know, in, in some signal space here. And so you can imagine that, you know, think of, let's say, the standard uh, lattice CN, that you can pick points out of a set of points, and these are now your code words in actual real space, right? So that's a slightly different setting. And so now you have the equivalent that we had beforehand. So the equivalent problem now is that how do you now, but in real space, pack points in real space? And again, you would like these points to be as far as part. Why? Because now in real space, the noise is typically some Gaussian noise that you add to it. And the further the points are apart, the better typically things will be. OK, so we have now the problem of how do we pack, right? And, you know, of course, early on already, you know, for example, Kepler already considered of how we could, for example, in three-dimensional space, pack spheres efficiently. Uh, and so you should think of these spheres about kind of a, a substitute for the distance, how far things are being, or half the distance. And the more spheres or oranges we can pack, the happier we are. Okay, so now one way to do a packing is to do in terms of a lattice. And a lattice is really the equivalent of a linear code. A linear code is you take, let's say, in the binary field, you're taking rows here uh, of these are all binary rows of length n. And the vector space that's formed by these, these are the set of points. So in this case, for example, these two points are formed by a vector space here. And in this case, the dimension would just be one. There are just two points in here. Okay? A lattice is exactly the same, but now in real space, now you're allowed to take vectors that have real components. And now the equivalent of this linearity here is that you're looking at the Z module. So this means you're looking at linear combinations of those. The only restrictions is that the uh, combinations that you pick have to be integer combinations. And so now, rather than getting points here in Hamming space, you're getting now points, let's say, in this trivial case in, in um, R2. And so all the points that lie on this lattice, so think of these two axes that you have, main axis as, as two of these rows in here. And all the points you get here will now be the points on the lattice. OK, so now there's, of course, you know, a fairly strong connection between these lattices and the points I talked about beforehand. One way to construct the lattice, and it's called construction A, is that you simply start with a code. And again, I can show you this only for a trivial case. So I start with a code, let's say, that has four points in here. So this is the Hamming cube. But now you think of this Hamming cube being embedded in real space, and you simply tile the whole space by these Hamming cubes, you shift them, and that's what you get. And so now that's a little bit difficult to see. So basically imagine these cubes, and now in each of these dimensions, you have to shift these cubes by two, okay? Now the only thing that has succeeded is tile it by two dimension. The third one was just too complicated, okay? So you have to imagine the third dimension. And so all the points that you now get would be the blue points. And so these blue points, perhaps that's the center, and you can see that essentially these are now the dimensions of the lattice, or these are the, 
the, the, the vectors that span the lattice. Now, if we actually do transmission, that's not the whole story because when we do transmission, we have also uh, in real space a power constraint. So we cannot just send any number of points that we want, right? The points, the code word points are those blue points here, but we have a power constraint. We have only finite power that we can spend to send a signal. And so typically you can imagine that this power constraint is that you simply take the points around, let's say, a center, but only those points that are within a certain sphere of a certain radius. And whatever the radius is, is simply the power constraint that you have imposed on, on, your, uh, on your device. Now you can see that this becomes already quite a little bit more complicated because even determining, right, so of course in three dimensions it's fairly easy, but imagine now that you have a thousand dimensions and that you have maybe two to the uh, thousand bits or two to the thousand such symbols that you have or such uh, points that you have in the lattice, even just to know which points are actually inside the sphere and which ones are outside the sphere, if you have everything in dimension thousand, is already a non-trivial uh, problem to, to uh, determine. And uh, so, you know, people have come up with all kinds of ingenious ideas of how to even address the points that would be inside a region that should look something like uh, a sphere just to do the decoding, not just to do the encoding. Okay, so now, um, there's a nice connection between these lattices and, uh, and the codes. Many of the nicest lattices that are around, like Gauss's, Barnes, uh, Leach lattices, these are all kind of rela related to certain classical codes, Hamming codes, Ritmiller codes, Golder codes, by doing constructions like this construction A. But given that there's a construction A, you can also imagine that there's, of course, a construction B and the construction C and the construction D and the construction, etc. Okay, so there are many, many nice, beautiful relationships. And many of these lattices you can, you can actually construct in various ways. Good. So now there were two, um, you know, there were two nice developments that happened in the, in, the, in the 70s that played actually a fundamental role of how uh, these uh, lattices were used in communications, in particular for the modems. And uh, the first one is something that's actually you know, fairly clear once you see it, mathematically uh, very simple, but it had a profound way of how uh, these modems were constructed and allowed to construct much, much better uh, communication systems. And that's what's called Ungerberg's set partitioning scheme. So let me just explain in a second what this scheme is. So far, uh, you know, we had simply a code and then we had the lattice points there, but we didn't really make use of the geometry of this space. So what Ungerberg realized is that you can do much better in the sense with much less effort achieve a very good performance if you think of the geometry as well. So what is the basic idea? Let's assume this is a two-dimensional, you know, just two-dimensional space and these are the points that I'm allowed to use in two dimensions and now you're using many of these two-dimensional things to have a, let's say, a thousand-dimensional space, right? And you're picking out the points in here. Well, some of these points are quite close, right? And so it's easy to confuse them, but some of these points are quite far apart and it's very unlikely that you will confuse them. So his basic idea was is to take this and to partition it. So for example, here is a particular partitioning of this what's called 16 QEM. And every time you partition, the idea is that the space, you know, that the, that the space between inside the partition, that the, diff, that the distance here, it's now you're cleaning this, is larger than the distance of, let's say, two points that are uh, between the two partitions, right? And so you go down further, and now you can see that now the distance is again larger, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so his basic idea was that if you now uh, think of them and you label this partition by, you know, simply you went, let's say, to the left, it's a zero, you went to the left, it's a zero, maybe then you go down here, uh, it's a one, that if you, for example, here on the bottom, these points might already be so far apart that there's no reason to have any particular strong code in there, okay? And so his idea was simply to construct it much more carefully rather than lumping everything together, put a very strong code on there and then work very hard to do the decoding Let's just partition it in this way and let's look at each layer and try to figure out what protection they actually need. Okay, and so it's a very simple idea, but it made it much, much, uh, you know, easier. Why? Because, for example, on this label, you might not have to code at all, so there's no effort that's done. And also, you know, uh, for example, at this level, you, you know, in the certain partition, you have to, you know, have a very strong code. But since this is only one of several bits in here, even if this code is not fantastic good, it's not very close to capacity, it's not that much that you lose because you only lose on that particular level. 
Okay? So this was a very uh, you know, a simple but profound idea that made it possible to come up with significantly better modems that, uh, uh, you know, in the 80s, uh, um, you know, I'm sure many of you probably still remember the modems that were used on telephone lines and they were based exactly on this scheme, which is called trellis coded modulation. The other basic idea is, again, something very simple, um, and it's, but, you know, it's implementation mathematics a little bit more complicated, but you can explain it in, you know, in a, in a, in a most basic version even, even easier. So just imagine you have two dimensions, and so, of course, you should imagine everything 9,000 dimensions, but we just have two, and let's assume these are the four points that we would be transmitting. Well, there's something in what's called wireless channel that's happening, and that's called fading. Fading simply could mean, in its simplest instance, that every dimension you have to think of, of one possible uh, point in time where you're transmitting a certain signal. So it can happen that, for example, you just walk around the corner, that just exactly at that point in time, when you're transmitting, let's say, this dimension, your signal completely fades. You get nothing. Okay? And so what this means is that, that these two points, which were first you know, reasonably far apart in space, suddenly completely collapse. Right? So that's clearly not very good. And again, you know, this is now in two dimensions, but you have to imagine that in a thousand dimensions. And so um, that's something called fading, and that you know, clearly would be catastrophic because there's no way, even if the noise is very, very small, there's no way to tell if it was this signal or this signal if you receive something like this. Right? So the basic idea that you can use is something that in two dimensions looks trivial, um, you know, simply rotate. Okay? So if you rotate these signals in here, and you would again have a fade in, let's say, this particular dimension. Well, these points would be closer together, but it would not be catastrophic. Okay? You would still see, actually, something. You would still be able to distinguish. And so now, of course, it's not quite as simple as rotating in two dimensions. Uh, as I said, think of it in 1,000 or 10,000 dimensions. Uh, think of it that the number of points you have is 2 to the something, 1,000, 2,000, or whatever. Uh, but it's the same principle that you have to apply. And so it's just some set of points. Uh, there are some very beautiful constructions that come, uh, that use algebraic number fields to construct lattices that are, uh, you know, not prone to this type of what's called fading and have what's called a much better diversity. So, so these catastrophic kind of failures that can happen, they are much better at tolerating them. Okay, so now this was um, what I wanted to say for the classical part, the applications, again, space <coughs> missions, and in particular the modems here. This was in 1984, was a big jump when this uh, first time lattice were used. It was about uh, 9,600 bits per second. Uh, okay, so that doesn't sound a lot these days when we have 50 megabits per second, but you know, it's also about 30 years ago. Um, and then the modem, the next modem here had about, you know, about 32 uh, kilobits per, per second, that's already uh, not too bad. Good, so what is the key, uh, key idea here is that, um, first of all, lattices are really the equivalent of standard linear code, okay? And if we use this geometry that we have in real space, then we can do much better. So one is this uh, set partitioning by, uh, by Ongerberg's uh, uh, thing, and the second one is that if we want to combat fading, uh, we can use some very nice uh, uh, number theoretic schemes to come up with lattices that give us good schemes. Okay, so now let me get, um, make a big jump forward. And this big jump forward is now to 1993. And in 1993, um, something very um, you know, exciting happened, uh, namely two people that were actually in circuit design, uh, namely Peru and Clavier, and that I don't think had done any coding beforehand, okay, but had tried to implement the code in, in an efficient circuit, came up with a completely different scheme, which uh, now there are many names, they call it turbo codes, but by now it's a bigger area called codes on graphs, low density parity check codes, uh, you know, many other names for the same one. And this caused you know, quite a big uh, uproar, so this was the paper that they had published in a conference in, um, in Geneva in 1993. And what happened at around the same time is that, uh, you know, at the beginning people didn't even believe that, you know, this were really so good because these codes were significantly better than what anyone else had come up at that point, particularly for the complexity they were able to show. But then what happened is was something very interesting. Uh, you know, there was something at this time around in the air because several other groups, 
with different backgrounds, people with statistical physics, computer scientists, but also classical coding theorists, they all, you know, over the next couple of years, um, often completely unaware of what other people had done, came up with ideas that were kind of uh, similar and related. And it took, I would say, uh, roughly to the year maybe 2000 or something like that, uh, for people to realize, uh, you know, that they essentially we're all talking about the same thing, uh, you know, that they were all the same principles. And so let me tell you a little bit what these principles are, and I will tell you in terms of uh, these low density parity codes. And in particular, what people realized is that what they had discovered or what they had invented was a version of something that Gallagher had, uh, you know, already come up with in the in the 1960s. Uh, that's not to take away at all from, uh, you know, what, what people did later, but it was something that had completely been forgotten. So what was the idea? The idea was that instead of, you know, forget about minimum distance, okay? Anything I told you right now, forget it, okay? Uh, these codes have, you know, are not based on trying to design codes with good minimum distance, but these codes go the other way around. These codes say, what is a good algorithm I might be able to use to do the decoding? and then ask what might be a good code for this particular algorithm, okay? So I'm not trying to design a good code first and then come up perhaps with an algorithm that might be able to do it, but I do it the other way around. And so how do I come up with the algorithm? The algorithm is simply taking one of the basic ideas or representation of these codes uh, a little bit more literally and trying, to, based on this representation, to, um, to use the representation itself as an algorithm. And what's this representation? It's in terms of what we would these days call a tenograph, and every linear code has a representation like this. It's a very simple representation. It's a bipartite graph in which these are the bits, so it's something very simple with 20 bits here. And then these would be 10 checks, and each of these checks is a linear parity check constraint, so each of these checks is a constraint over G of 2 that says a certain number of these bits here must sum up to 0. That's it, okay? Every linear code has a representation like this. Now, what was special about, um, you know, Gallagher's idea and, and the idea uh, that came later on. Well, especially is that you don't just take any linear code, but you take a linear code that's sparse. Okay, so what does sparse mean? You take a code that has very few edges. And so in, in the representation here, what this would mean is that I take every bit here in the simplest case, for example, to have degree three. Okay, so every variable node here participates, let's say, in three checks. And perhaps every check here I would take to check six bits. Okay, and so now what you should think about is that these parameters stay fixed, three and six stay fixed, but the length of the code will go large. Okay, so maybe perhaps a thousand bits or 10,000 bits or 100,000 bits. So that the number of edges that I have here is simply a constant times n. Okay, and so that's very different from a standard code. If I simply randomly pick these checks, then I would get n squared edges, and that's very different. Okay, so that's the first important thing. Now, what are some other parameters in here? Well, I have so many bits, I have so many checks. Every check takes degree, uh, away one degree of freedom. So in terms of these parameters, I can uh, basically tell you what the rate is, and the rate will be basically one minus the degree of uh, the variable nodes divided by the degree of the check nodes. So in this case, this would be a half, okay? Good, so that's the code. And now what's, uh, you know, one other idea that when you try to analyze it, is that you don't really look now at a single, a single code, but you look at an ensemble. You look at the whole family of such code because it will make it much easier to analyze. And so what does it mean? Well, if any of you have seen the configuration model uh, that's standard in for random graphs, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, you have these nodes. These nodes have degrees and their edges. And so if we're deciding how to put the edges, the easiest way is to say, if this is a node of degree three, make here three sockets and so on and so on. Number all these sockets, do the same thing on the right-hand side. The total number of sockets has to match up, and I'll simply pick a permutation at random and match things up, and that's your code, okay? And so if you do this, you will get a whole ensemble of such codes. Every time you pick a random permutation with uniform distribution, you might get a different code, and it turns out that if you think of large enough codes, all these codes essentially behave the same, and so it's sufficient if we just figure out what a random such code behaves. Okay, now, um, what's important is here that, as I said, that what's really the key is to think of the algorithm, right? So this is a graph, this is a code that's well suited for the following algorithm, which is called message passing, and it also goes by many different names. Uh, some of you might have heard of uh, Perl's belief propagation algorithm. If you go back to the physics literature, there's something called Bethe free energy, which is 
you know, fairly related. It's not an algorithmic uh, characterization, but it's essentially the same, uh, the same concepts, and there might be other names for uh, exactly the same algorithm, too. So what is the idea? Well, the idea is this is, again, our graphical representation, this tenograph of the code. But now, in addition, we have these little dongles here, and they tell you something about the likelihoods that a certain bit might, you know, let's assume you send a zero, what's the probability, given that I've sent a bit, let's say zero, that I actually receive, let's say, a one, or that I receive a question mark, right? So this, these extra dongles here tell you the probability that certain bits or what happens on the channel. So they characterize what the channel is. And so if you think now of the whole model here, this whole graphical model is just a, a graphical model that represents the posterior distribution, okay? So what do I mean with this? If you now see at, at this point here a certain, you know, outcomes, let's say zero, one, one, zero, whatever, and so on, then this thing here just encodes the posterior distribution that these bits took on certain values conditioned on what the output was here, okay? So that's just a compact representation of, a, of the posterior probability distribution. And what else is nice about this is because everything is very sparse, we have only few edges in this, whole, in this whole graph here, and so there's a factorization where every factor only involves a small number of variables that I have in here. And for such situations, um, you know, a message passing algorithm, so a local greedy algorithm, works actually quite well, okay? And in particular, the point is that we are not, you know, we are, we are not bound to use any particular graph but we are actually in control and we can, given the algorithm, pick a graph that works well under these, con uh, under these situations. Okay, so we have a lot of degree of freedom on designing this graph. Now, uh, you know, just in case you haven't, uh, you know, seen kind of how this message passing algorithm works, let me just show it to you in the simplest possible setting. It's called the binary erasure setting. So this is a trivial graph which has only three uh, variables and two uh, and two checks here, okay? So this represents an, um, a, a code that has only two code words, okay? And the code words were the one where these checks are both fulfilled. So let's assume now that that's what I receive. I receive zero, question mark, and question mark, and so I don't know what these bits are and I would like to decode, okay? So the idea is that you're simply sending messages back and forth and that these messages are the best local estimate you have about the bit, okay? And you simply send it back and forth and you hope that things will converge, and for the BC, it's pretty obvious what you should do. You should check for each of these checks and try to see greedily whether or not you can make deductions, right? For example, this is a zero, this is a question mark, but the mod two sum of these two things, right, must be zero. So it's fairly obvious that this one here must be a zero, right, because that's the only locally consistent, uh, uh, consistent configuration that I can make. So what you do is you're sending messages back and forth. You start with the original received messages, you do some, you try to come up with local deductions. So for example, can I locally greedily deduce what this is based on these two values? No, I can't because one is a zero, one is a question mark. This is an XOR, so I don't really know what the value is. Okay, so I sent back a zero. But for other ones, for example, on top, as I said, I do know what this is because zero plus question mark must be equal to zero, so I actually know what the value is. And I go back and forth, send things back and forth, and hopefully I can decode. Now, in 1997, um, and I quote the paper in, in, in a second, uh, Luby, Mitzmacher, uh, uh, Schokolai, Spielmann, and Seemann uh, came up with a very nice uh, um, uh, analysis exactly of this case for the binary erasure channel. And the upshot is that there's an extremely compact representation of how such a scheme works. So the way you have to think about it, you take such a graph that I described to you, degree, let's say, three on the left, degree six on the right, and you think of a very large graph and you think about under which circumstances, how bad can the erasure probability be such that with high probability it will converge to the correct solution. And so the, the final answer, okay, is very simple. And it goes as follows. If this is the erasure probability here, okay, and so think of this as right now as the, as the uh, so this is the erasure probability of the channel, and this is the final erasure probability after you're done with decoding, when you can no longer make progress. Then the performance, the asymptotic performance is, is given by a curve that looks like this, whose description is just this fixed point characterization. Okay, so this is the, the final erasure probability you think of, and this is the channel parameter, and these are the two degrees, the right degree and the left degree. And so you can see that there is an explicit characterization as epsilon, 
as a function of the x we end up with. And this curve is just this, this curve here. Okay, it's an extremely simple characterization. And so what turns out is that if, you, if you're transmitting below this value, then with high probability you will be able to decode. But if you're transmitting above the value, then with high probability you will be stuck somewhere at this point, and you have an explicit characterization where you'll be stuck with. Okay, so that's very nice. Very simple characterization, very clean. And so now the question is, is this a good code or not? Well, this is a plot for a 3.6 code. As I told you, a 3.6 code has rate a half. The capacity uh, you know, for that, or the worst erasure probability that you should be able to tolerate is also half. Well, if you look at this, it's not quite a half. It's about 43%. That's not too bad, okay? It's a, it's a very low complexity algorithm, but it's not quite capacity. Capacity would be here. So the other very nice idea that uh, this set of authors had in their paper is that they said, well, we don't need to pick this graph to be a regular graph, right? We can pick more complicated graphs. In, in particular, we could just pick that, let's say, some of the nodes are degree two, some are degree three, some are degree four, et cetera, right? And the analysis is, carries over you know, uh, very simply if, if you just take non, you know, what's called irregular graphs. But they were able to actually come up with a degree distribution, so a fraction of nodes that had the various, uh, had, you know, had various degrees. And you know, the exact form uh, is, is not really that important. And if you plug this one in, okay, then you will see that you actually can achieve capacity. Okay? So you can get arbitrarily close to the Shannon limit with an algorithm which is just this low complexity algorithm uh, and um, you, know, you can construct uh, beautiful codes. And actually, once you understand how this works, there's not just one, but there are many, many ways of doing this. Okay, so this is for the binary ratio channel. What about more complicated channels? Well, it turns out you can do the same thing, um, except it's a little bit more complicated. In the general case, you're not, you're not uh, you know, sending back and forth just bits or question marks you're actually sending back and forth probabilities. And so to do the analysis a little bit uh, more complicated and there's no uh, explicit um, characterization of the, of, the, of the threshold that you get, there's an implicit one in terms of a fixed point characterization, but if you actually want to compute a value, you have to do compute numerically what this value is. But you can do this. Um, and so this is uh, uh, Seyong Chung some years ago. He constructed now codes and degree distributions that are good for this. And so what is this? This is now the Gaussian channel. This is how much energy you spend. You want to be on the left. This is the capacity region according to Shannon. And you want to be as close as this. And so he came up with certain degree distributions of increasing degrees that get you know, very, very close to this. Now, you know, of course, you know, some degrees, for example, this point here, which is extremely close, is degree 8,000. And you can ask, you know, will you have a, a graph with a degrees 8,000? Uh, and the other thing that you can ask, uh, you know, how close is this really? Well, so in order to compare it, you have to check what happened before, you know, turbo codes were invented. Where were we? Well, this is around 0 0.18. Uh, before the turbo thing, we weren't here, okay? We weren't here, okay? We weren't here, we were actually outside of the room, okay? So this was about three on this scale, okay? I would have to go through this door, okay, to show you the point. So clearly, that was a big advance in trying to come up uh, with good codes. And so even though you, know, you wouldn't really operate here because these are ridiculously large degrees, you can construct codes that get very close and actually um, achieve a good fraction of, of that with reasonable complexity. Okay, now you could do more. Um, you can uh, look at also the finite length performance. You cannot just uh, look at the infinite length one and you can try to do some optimiz optimization. Uh, so for example, here this says, try to come up with code whose curve, error probability curve, is below this gray box here and come up with the highest rate you can do. And so you can actually do that. And that was done in various contexts, either for LDBC codes or by people here, for example, Big Carp and, and Luby in the context of what's called um, rateless codes. And so you can also try to optimize codes for finite lengths. Good. So where are these kind of codes? Well, since 1993, and uh, you know, essentially there are everywhere, okay? You cannot have any device that doesn't contain it. That doesn't mean that all the other codes are gone because, uh, you know, for legacy reasons, typically devices have all, uh, all kinds of standards in there, but there's essentially no new standard that doesn't use these kind of either turbo kind, LDBC, R8, there are many, many versions, but essentially this idea, okay? So that's really the standard and the workhorse now in pretty much uh, most communication, modern communication standards. So what were the key ideas? Forget about minimum distance, okay? Simply come up, start with an algorithm, this message passing algorithm, and then 
find a code or graph that works well under this message passing and you are in control of finding this graph. And if you find a good graph, then uh, you know, it can, this combination can work very, very well. It has very low complexity. And in particular, one of the things that I have not mentioned is that for classical coding, it's very hard to take into account what's called soft information. What is soft information? Well, if I have only zeros and ones or, or question mark or not, that's kind of a hard information. It's just, you know, it's binary, right? But if I have, let's say, a Gaussian channel, then I not just get a received value, but I get also a value that tells me the reliability. How certain am I about that this value represents a zero and one? And these codes are, you know, perfect for also, uh, you know, taking that into account. And this soft information can be very important to get close to uh, capacity. As I said, uh, in the Louis et al. one, uh, you know, there were explicit constructions for capacity achieving such codes. Uh, in the general case, uh, you can characterize uh, by a fixed point equation what the threshold is, but at the end, when you actually have to compute the value, there's some computation that you have to do. Okay, now let me get to the last two um, uh, ideas. Um, until you know, recently, information theory, which really says what the limits are, and coding theory, which tries to come close to these limits which with, uh, with low complexity schemes, they were a little bit like cousins, but cousins that were not really on speaking terms, okay? So, you know, yes, they were closely related, okay? But they were a little bit awkward when they got together, right? So if you, if you let's say, taught a class in information theory, you would talk about mutual information and capacity and, and all the quantities here. And then, you know, if you also include a little bit something about how you can actually achieve these limits, then suddenly you talked about Hemming distance and other metrics, and there was no real direct connection, okay? So there, there was no capacity that suddenly appeared in, in the construction of codes, et cetera, right? Now, fortunately, this situation is over, okay? So we have now codes that have, that show a very beautiful connection between them, and they're due to Erdal Arikan, and they're called polar codes. And if any of you, you know, teach a class, that's the perfect example that you should use. They're low complexity, uh, they're capacity achieving. They also have, you know, some problems here and there, but particular for pedagogical reason, there's nothing that's better than that. Okay, so let's look at how they go. Um, okay, so, um, so we have, let's say, uh, two channels here, okay? And so we have these two channels, and so these are two, the same channels. Let's assume the binary ratio channel. Now, let's append to these two uses of the channel a small little linear transform. So these are two bits, these are two bits. That's just the matrix 1, 0, 1, 1, a very simple matrix, okay? So we're just using these two together, and these we're thinking of our input bits. Now, um, let's think of this now in the following way. Let's assume we first want to recover U1, given the observation here, but we have no idea about what U2 is, okay? So what are the set of equations for this? Well, if you look at this up here, u1 is x1 plus x2, u1 is x1 plus x2, that's just the x, uh, xor in here, right? And both x1 we receive and x2 we receive. So in other words, what this means is that u1 is just the xor of, let's think of, for example, the binary uh, symmetric channel, it's just the xor of the two received things that we have, okay? So that's what the u1 will be. And that's what's just called a parity check code. Okay, now let's assume that by some miracle I was able to figure out what the U1 is, and I'm looking at the U2, okay? So U2, we have two sets of equations. Number one, U2 is equal to X2, that's this line here, and then X2 we receive, okay? So it's a version, a noisy version we receive here. But also we have the equation that, uh, that we have U2 is X1 plus U1. U1 we already know, so it's just a constant, think of it as zero. So we have another version of the, of the U2 here, right? So this is now something which is called a repetition code. We basically get twice the same information in here, okay? Now, nothing has really happened. Since this transform is one on one, the overall capacity between here and here is the same as the capacity between in here and here. But let's now look at what happens if this particular channel, for example, have the BC, then it's easy to, to check. Well, if these two things are erased with probability epsilon, what's the chance that this is erased? Well, it's an XOR, so it's erased if either of them is erased, which happens with one minus one minus epsilon squared probability. Okay, so this is worse, right? Uh, okay, but what happens on the other side? Well, this is only erased if both of them are erased, okay, and that happens with probability epsilon squared, which is better, right? Okay, so now what is the total capacity of, if I'm thinking of these two channels now separately? For the erasure channel capacity is one minus the erasure probability, so the total capacity is 
1 minus this expression, which is just the 1 minus epsilon squared. And on the, this is 1 minus this, which is 1 minus epsilon squared. If I sort this out, it's exactly 2 times the original capacity that I have. Okay? Now, that it's just 2 times the capacity is not surprising because there was no capacity loss. And in, this is true in general. Okay, if I'm just thinking of a general, if I'm thinking of these two, the mutual information between input and output, that's exactly the same as the mutual information between this and this, but that's just twice the mutual or the capacity of the channel itself. Okay, so that's simply because I have a one-to-one -one map. And if I'm thinking of now the splitting, the successive decoding, that's just something, in case you have seen it, which is called simply the chain rule of mutual information. Okay, so again, there's no loss on first thinking of one channel, and then condition that I know this looking at the other one. Okay, these two types of channels cleanly separate. There's no loss of information involved in here. Okay, so um, if I do this now, if I can do it once, okay, so then I get two channels. This is better. Uh, this is worse. This is better. But if I can do it once, there's no reason I can don't do it twice, right? And if I do it again, and so now I take two blocks like this, and I combine again like channels, then I get the 0 0.75, which becomes, you know, two of these copies becomes even worse. And so some of them become even worse, some of them become very good. Let me do it three times. And you can kind of see already why this will call polarization codes, because these numbers will actually polarize to either 0 or 1. Okay, so that's really the miracle of polar codes. So let me just give you another, another picture of this. These are 1,000 channels to start with. They all have, let's say, originally erasure probably epsilon. I take always two pairs of them, okay? Some of them will be 0 0.75, some of them will be 0 0.25. Uh, I do this again, I get four values, okay? Some of them will be very close to one, some very close to zero. Okay, I do this eight times. You can kind of see it already, some move up, some move down. And so I do this now, okay? Um, and I do this operation 10 times until I have uh, I've exactly taken all these thousand channels together. And now you can see a lot of them sitting on top. These are completely useless channels. They see an erasure probability of epsilon versus a lot of them sit at the bottom. And these are very good channels that see essentially erasure probability zero. And since I don't lose anything during the, you know, I've shown that by doing this, there's no loss of information, the number of things that are good must be exactly equal to the capacity of the channel, okay, times the length. So how do I use this now? Very simple idea. This is again my setup here. I've said that some of these uh, channels will be good or bad, so let's look at this. I do a successive decoder over this, so let me look at the top channel, for example. If you stare a little bit at it, and you look at what the top, top channel depends on, given the received values, and given that you know nothing about this, then this top channel just looks like this. It's just a complete binary tree in which each of these operations is just an XOR. Okay, so this, this top channel here, all it sees is the XO of the received one. So this is a very bad channel. Okay, if any of them is, is flipped, or if any of them is erasure, you can't see anything. But each of these other one also is this type of channel. So for example, if you look at the next one in the successive order, it's a slightly better channel because it sees here repetition. And so if at least you know, one of these branches, for example, is received in the binary erasure channel, you will actually receive the top. And so you can go through, you can characterize all these channels here. There will be a thousand channels here. This is the worst one, so it sees all X or this is the best one, which sees a repetition. And so what turns out that each of them will be either a very good or a very bad channel. Okay, and you have exactly the right number of good channels in here. So how do you do coding on them? Very simple. You simply write them down. Think of this as a thousand. Uh, let's assume red means very bad channel, blue means very good channel. You have the right number of good and bad channels. Okay, and so um, feel. Okay, good. Um, not sure how we can get rid of this. Okay, perfect. So now, how do you uh, how do you do this? Okay, so you simply freeze all these which are very bad channels, you declare them to a fixed value, let's say zero, you go down in the decoding order from zero, one, two, three, etc. Every time you see a channel that's red, it's frozen, you know the value and you have declared the value both at the receiver and transmitter, no problem. Anytime you see actually a blue channel, it's a channel that's very good and you can just decode it by this very simple algorithm which just takes n log n um, uh, complexity and it's very easy to, um, to decode. Okay, so that's the idea of polar codes. Uh, polar codes are very, very nice, um, uh, you know, parameters. They are provable capacity achieving for a wide array of channels. People have, uh, you know, 
people have come up with uh, extensions that go, you know, once you, you see the basic principle, you can not just use this for channel coding, you can use this for source coding, for uh, multi, uh, you know, for not just point to point channels, but pretty much any channel you can think of. There's a version of this polarization here. And now, are there already applications? Not really, okay, so this is 2008. You know, perhaps in your 2000, uh, you know, in, in your whatever, you know, 2020 in your iPhone 10, you have it, okay, and, and you should expect some polarizing reviews for these kind of uh, um, uh, for these kind of codes. But it's quite possible that you will actually see them uh, in in uh, applications. I hope so. It's certainly true that if you want to teach kind of coding, then within a few hours you can give a scheme that gets you from uh, you know with some very basic. Uh, um, uh, math can prove that you can achieve capacity uh, achieving schemes with low complexity. Uh, the only thing that we're using is the chain rule of mutual information here, uh, 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 this here, okay? And you need uh, a little bit, to, so this just shows you that you don't lose anything in the step to show that you actually have polarization. There's a beautiful proof by Emre Talata who just uses the fact that if you can show that at every single step um, you kind of increase the variance of these numbers that you get, then again, it must follow that you get polarization. And so with a little bit more work, you can prove how fast this polarization happens, and that gives you some bound on the, um, on the behavior of these codes. Okay, now let me get to the last idea, okay? The last idea is, is physics, okay? Now, how, does, uh, how, does, how can you use physics to come up with uh, better codes? And now, the type of codes are called spatial coupling, okay? And so how does that go, okay? Now, we all know that uh, diamonds are forever, okay? Except that that's not true, okay? Uh, because diamonds are not the most stable form uh, of carbon. Uh, and so it's just a matter of time until, uh, you know, it's, at least it's not the most stable form of carbon in the, you know, under, under the current atmospheric uh, pressures that we experience. I guess it was when they were formed. And so it's just a matter of time that this one will go actually in this, okay? Now, even though, of course, it might be that this is uh, probably millions of years, and so you don't have to be uh, particularly worried. But uh, nevertheless, if you're trying to, you know, contemplating buying one of these, okay, it might actually be a safer bet to buy one of these because eventually that's exactly what you will get, okay? Now, what, why is that true? Well, um, Diamonds is a metastable form of carbon, so it's not the lowest energy state that carbon can, uh, uh, can take on. And so eventually um, it will go to this most stable state, but it doesn't just do uh, spontaneously. Even though it's metastable, it needs something initially to initiate this, uh, this process. And so metastability is something that can be very useful. Uh, for example, you all probably have seen, or perhaps many of you have used heat packs, right? So heat pack is another metastable form uh, of some liquid, so this is sodium acetate, for example. And so this one can also have two forms, the metastable state, which is the liquid form, and the stable state, which is a crystalline form. And so um, how do you get from one to the other one? There's a little, you know, uh, little metal disc in here. If you click on that disc, it will start a process which is called nucleation. It will form a small nucleus. And once the nucleus is there, you will actually grow the crystal. And since the, since the crystal form has lower energy state, when you actually do this, you will give off heat, right? And that's exactly the heat that you will see in the heat pack. And the nice thing about the heat pack is that that's reversible. You throw it back into water, you put heat back, it goes back into the, uh, into the metastable state and becomes a liquid. Okay, so what does this have to do with coding? Well, we can use exactly this principle uh, also for coding. Now, this interpretation I give you now, you know, I learned from physicists, I'll, I'll, um, I'll mention them a little bit later. The codes, you know, came before, and, but then later on people realized that that's exactly what's actually happening. So, how do you do this? We are back in our realm of LDBC codes that we had before, and, but now what we do is we pick several of those, okay? Um, and so what you should think of is that each of them is already a reasonable sized one, okay? I just draw something that has whatever, maybe 10 nodes, but you should think of each of them already a code of a reasonable size. And now you put them around, let's say, in a circle. Okay, so if you just do this, this itself is again a code, but wouldn't be particularly interesting, okay? This code would just simply be behave like 20 independent codes. But what happens now if you actually start connecting them? If you start connecting them, so how, what do I mean with this? Well, just for example, there are many ways of doing it. For example, take every edge that you have in here, flip a coin, let's say that has three sides, and then depending on how the coin flip is, you connect it to the left, 
you stay maybe in the middle or you connect it to the right. Okay, so what you want at the end is something that looks like a picket fence where you're connecting neighboring uh, graphs, but you want to do it in such a way that actually the, the, the local graph structure doesn't, stays the same. So if, for example, if originally this was a 3, 6 code where every variable node had degree 3, every check node had degree 6, you wanted that after that it's again a, locally a 3, 6 code. Okay, we don't want to change this. Okay, so now if we do this, this is completely symmetric, okay? And if you use that as a code, which is a perfect code again, okay? What happens? Um, nothing happens, okay? It behaves exactly like this. So in order for anything to happen, what we need to do is we need to uh, somehow get rid of this perfect symmetry, okay? And so how do we do this? One way to do this is to, you can think of that you simply cut the graph somewhere, and how can you cut it? One way to cut it is if you simply set, let's say, bits at some position here to a known value, then if these are a known value, then essentially the edges are for nothing, okay? If this is a known value of a bit, all it will ever send out is a known value and you can forget about it. It's the same thing as if you cut the graph. And once we cut it, we can simply take this and we can, you know, put it out again to something that looks at picket fence. It's just slightly nicer to see it now in a, in a local linear structure, okay? So what will happen if you do this? Now let's run again. Uh, you know, transmit, this is a code, transmit it again over your favorite channel and use exactly the message passing algorithm that I talked about before, right? So what will happen? Well, um, you know, we have first a few parameters. We have the length of the coupling. We have the local coupling with here and we have, the, we have the local structure of the code that we have in here. And so let me now show you how this would behave if you run this. And so what do I show you? I'll show it for a simple channel. Think of the binary ratio channel. This is the channel parameter. This is, the, this is the threshold that we originally got for the underlying graph. Let's say the 3, 6 code, remember, was about 43%. And so now what I showed you here is like 100 of these instances, each of these lines, which you can't see very well, is just one of them. And I'm showing you the local erasure probability as I'm, uh, as I'm continuing to do the iteration, okay? So what will happen is you see that essentially, let me run it one more time, if you looked at this, what happens in the middle, if you ignore the boundary, this would behave, each of them would behave essentially exactly like the uncoupled system, okay? So these points that you see here in the middle would be exactly what you would see for the same parameter for a single system. Not very interesting. What's interesting is if you take the same graph and now you go above the, what, the, what the uncoupled system can do and you go, you know, just below what the system could do if you did optimum decoding, map decoding, which in general, you know, quite complex, you know, to do, would be in general exponential complex to do. And now we run it again. So what will happen is very quickly it will go down, but then we'll get stuck. That's exactly the fixed point that I had talked to you about, okay? But because of the boundary, at the boundary we see locally more, we have more information there, okay? This was due that we had fixed some bits there. What will happen is that actually this is like a wave that moves in and decoding can locally happen, okay? So let me show you it once again. We'll, we'll start the process. This gets stuck in the middle, but at the boundary it actually doesn't get stuck. At the boundary we can still do decoding. Every iteration, think of it as a wave, as a tsunami that goes in at a constant speed into the thing and can actually decode, okay? And so this decoding works all the way up to the map threshold of the code, so up to the optimum processing that you could do, even though this is a local and low complexity algorithm. Now, of course, if you go above, there's nothing you can do. You will get stuck, and that's it, okay? Show me, let me show you maybe one other thing. It's the same thing. As you do the parameter and go down with the parameter, you would get stuck, but as soon as you go below the map threshold, you will see that this fixed point in which you get stuck will evaporate, and you can slowly do the decoding until you actually do optimum processing, okay? Good, so um, maybe the final illustration of this, um, if you go back to the physics interpretation, if you take water and you put this water in what's called a super, uh, super cool state, so you can freeze water below zero, but if the water is very clean, it will actually not freeze, it will have, it's again a, a, a metastable state that can last a few hours. But as soon as you actually bump it and you, you, you initiate the process, this nucleation process, then actually the water will start freezing. And this chain is exactly the same thing what happens here, okay? So the physics interpretation is that at the boundary, that's the nucleation process. You start the decoding, okay? It's just the same thing as how crystal grows, for example. You need first a small seed in which you get started. Once you get started and the seed is sufficiently large, you have a sufficiently large thing at the boundary, this process will simply go on and will bring the metastable state to the stable state. And for us, that's good because for us, this means decoding. 
OK, so um, with this, you can construct some very good codes. For example, for rate uh, half, the capacity should be half. Just by making the degrees a little bit larger, you can see that uniformly, universally, across all the channels, you can get extremely close to capacity, which would, in this case, be half by just picking uh, codes with this particular structure. And you can prove that you achieve the capacity up to some small exponential term, where the expo exponential term is simply in the degrees that you have to pick. OK, so um, now what are applications like this? Again, these are fairly new codes, about 2010. Um, you know, people think about uh, in optical um, communication, I think that would be a very good uh, application. So if, if you think of the backbone of the internet, there are several companies that uh, are trying to see if they could use these type of codes uh, for optical communication. OK, so let me wrap up um, what were the key ideas here. A little help at the boundary gets things started. That's the nucleation process. And then the proper structure ensures that this uh, thing continues. That's the crystallization process. It's a universal phenomena that, again, you can use for a wide variety of applications, not just for coding. Uh, compressive sensing, for example, would be another thing that uh, thinks that, that would benefit. So what's the next big challenge? Well, probably the next big challenge would be uh, to look at what's called the finite length performance. We know I've shown you now like, you know, three, four different coding schemes that all get you to capacity if the codes are long enough. But what's not so easy is to construct codes that are relatively short and are close. Okay? So these are the curves. This would be somewhere the threshold. What is if I have only a length of 1,000 to spare? You know, it's not so easy to come up with schemes or coding schemes that for short lengths get you very close to capacity. Okay? And so the question is, you know, where? Uh, so, so the way this approach, these codes, this is uh, given by what's called a scaling exponent that tells you how fast in the length things would approach. And so the scaling exponent can be very different for various codes. The optimum is two, which would mean that the gap to capacity that you see scales like one over the square root of the block length. But many of these coding schemes that I told you do not behave as good. Okay, so optimum, the gap would be just one over the, um, um, sorry, the, the block length needed to get a gap of delta would be one over delta squared. But polar codes are almost, the, 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 the length is needed is almost the square of that. It's about one over. Mm. Uh, delta fourth. The spatial couple is one over delta third. Uh, LDBC is one over delta squared, but they don't actually scale to the capacity, but to another threshold. Okay, so what we really would need still is codes that are good for short lengths, um, where we should get some inspiration from. Well, you know, people used algebra, they used number theory, probability. I don't know what's, what's next, perhaps biology, okay. There's already things, spinal codes, okay. Quantum, okay, I have no idea, okay, maybe. We used physics, perhaps we should metaphysics, okay? <laughs> so there, there must be a code somewhere in there, okay? But perhaps, you know, sad but not true, perhaps the best inspiration should be the past, okay? Um, for example, some of the codes that might actually be the best is called Reed Miller codes. They're very close to polar codes. Um, it's just that we neither know, you know, how to decode them efficiently, and we actually can't really prove that they're very good. Um, but uh, they might actually be, uh, you know, fantastic codes to use in practice if we just knew how to process them. Uh, final two slides, these are courtesy of Dan Costello. Uh, I've only talked about, you know, this is over the years how people came up with schemes. Every point is, you know, the life of a researcher or, or, or engineer in the field, okay? And so you can see that, that you know, only touched upon some of these schemes in here. Um, and there are many, many more. And that's even just a point to point one. I haven't talked about rateless code. Uh, I haven't talked about network coding. I haven't talked about, uh, uh, you know, many other, you know, interesting developments. Um, and uh, also Dan had a nice you know, set of slides of some people involved. Again, this was, I think, 2008. Uh, there are many faces uh, you know, might be missing, and he, I think he didn't even put his own picture in there. Um, but what I like about coding is that I think it's a very diverse field, you know, has drawn inspirations from many, many different areas. And I think there's all reason to believe that this will continue like that. And so that's why I enjoy working in this area. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Everything is clear. 
So this had to do, which I you know skipped over, is is that um, you have two parameters now. The block length is is con you know is composed of how many bits you have per position, and then how many positions you have in the coupling length. And so there are two reasons why you're bounded away from capacity. One is the actual scaling of, of codes when you're close uh, you know, for a certain length L. So that has simply to do with how many points you have. You have to have in sufficiently many points per position. And there's some fundamental bounds that say if you don't, you're bounded away. But the other thing is that if the length, you have the length. And so one thing I didn't mention is that at the boundary, you're losing some bits because you have to get the process started. That's the nucleation. And so if you don't make this length large enough, then you will also be, be bounded away. And so if you, if you balance what is the best thing, you get one over delta third. Okay. Further questions? Let's thank the speaker again. That was great. Thank you.